Bangladesh, and I'm outside the Hub Culture Pavilion here in Davos, joined by one of my favorite people, Caroline Webb. Thanks for stopping by. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So your book, How to Have a Good Day, tell me what was behind the inspiration to write it. Well, I've been working for about 15, 20 years with people in professional contexts to help them be at their best. And my thing has always been to use behavioral science in that. So by behavioral science, I mean neuroscience, psychology, behavioral economics, to help them identify tiny tweaks to their daily routines that can improve their productivity and their well-being. So give me just an example. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that uh, we're doing a lot this week is having amazing conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we're having such amazing conversations, I think, is because we are assuming that everybody here is fascinating. And if you know about confirmation bias, mm -hmm. we know that the way that the brain works is that whatever is top of mind for you in terms of your expectations and assumptions will guide what you perceive. And I think one of the reasons we are having such wonderful conversations is we go into everything in Davos assuming that people are interesting. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that in the workplace every day? And it turns out that when people do, they have much better relationships with their colleagues. So how do you put yourself in the mindset that you're going into an interesting conversation if you just haven't, frankly, had a great <laughs> few moments walking down the road to get there? You know, it's a good question because, you know, I'm always interested in what's the smallest possible thing that's the most realistic thing you can integrate into your day. And really, it is a question of just as you're walking towards a person thinking, what do I really want to notice? What do I want to look out for? I mean, if you go into a conversation you think they're going to be a jerk, you will notice everything that confirms that they are a jerk. Now, they may be a jerk, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you might miss the one little uh, sign of possible collaboration or, you know, warmer, warmer mm -hmm. intent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just taking a moment to say, what is it that I want to notice? Maybe you want to notice opportunities for collaboration. You might not turn the guy into a saint, but you mm -hmm. will then be much more likely magically to notice uh, opportunities for collaboration. So what implications does the book have for the theme here at Davos, responsible and responsive leadership? You know, I wrote the book for individuals, mm -hmm. but my background uh, is in leadership coaching and leadership development. And one of the reasons that I wrote the book is kind of as a manifesto for a different type of leadership. You know, if you think about a lot of conversations here this week are about automation, how that's going to radically change the workforce. And we do know that a huge uh, proportion of the activities that we're all undertaking are actually automatable. Mm -hmm. But the, if you think about the areas that are least automatable, there was a McKinsey report that suggested that leading and managing people, very uh, difficult to automate. Uh, making decisions and being creative, also pretty difficult to automate. And I think that in the future, those leaders who have an understanding of how to bring wisdom, creativity, and empathy out of their people are going to be those that outperform and are going to be able to do extraordinary things. And in order to bring wisdom, empathy, and creativity out of the people you're working with, you need to have an understanding of the human mind. And I do believe that the small, I have seen the small changes that come out of uh, the kind of uh, amazing research that's out there in, in behavioral science, you know, they really do make a difference in the way that a leader is able to get the best out of the people around them. So give me an example of a leader that you've seen who uses something, so this kind of yeah. nudge or this kind of creativity that yeah. you're talking about. Well, actually, there's a guy that I think is so thoughtful about this stuff that he... He almost built his company around it. You know, he was in a classic um, advertising agency background and he felt the culture was very toxic and so he wanted to create uh, an environment that was, that was sort of more attuned to how people's brains work. So the thing that um, you know, I love, there are many examples I could pick out, but he knows about the perils of multitasking. Mm -hmm. He knows that we make between two and four times as many errors when we multitask and that we slow ourselves down by perhaps as much as 30% or more. And that's terrible when you think mm, about productivity yeah. and helping people think clearly and yeah. think well. So he very deliberately and very visibly goes offline. And he's, he legitimizes it, makes it okay to talk about the power of going offline. He'll go for a walk visibly mm -hmm. and invite people to come with him to show that he's taking that sort of strategic downtime that we mm -hmm. know our brains need. You know, the longer it is since we've taken a break, the worse our decisions are. And you've seen this in studies across multiple contexts. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, how many leaders are really visibly role modeling going for a break when you know, they need to? So I think that you know, this role modeling that, that he's doing, his name's Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, I think is really extraordinary. And I talk about that in, uh, in part two of the book. Thank you so much, Caroline, for stopping by. And I'm going to invite you, you now to take a break with me and walk down the streets of Davos. Fantastic, let's go. <laughs>